Hi everybody, it's You Had to Ask, the show where I answer your questions, and this week my first question comes to me from DeedsYosu071, who asks, what are your thoughts on Elvis Presley, king of rock and roll or overrated? Also, who is more famous, Elvis or Michael Jackson? Well, king of rock, king of rock and roll is just like a, a slogan. I mean, people say that and throw that around. That's just a nickname that they gave Elvis. So, I, I mean, do I think he's the king of rock and roll in the sense that he's like the greatest rock star ever? Uh, no. <laughs> so, I mean, in that sense, if we take the title more literally, uh, uh, then I do think he's overrated. I mean, I, all I can say is personally, uh, Elvis's music has never struck me as bad in any sense, but it's never meant very much to me personally. And I mean, I know the rap on Elvis is that he was a white guy who just did what black artists had been doing for years, only he was white and therefore was able to get more visibility and more cultural acceptance and became the king of rock and roll, and he was really just doing stuff that other people had been doing in relative obscurity already. Um, and I think that's probably true. I don't necessarily blame Elvis for that. Elvis didn't make America a racist country. <laughs> he was a product of it, and he was a resident in it just like everybody else, and he just did his thing the way he knew how to do it and became very successful. I mean, it is unfortunate that the black artists who inspired him uh, were less able to reap the rewards of their music than Elvis was of his. I mean, that's definitely a, a travesty, uh, but, but I don't blame Elvis for that, and I, I don't think that he deserves any scorn for that, because, again, he was just doing his thing in the environment that he happened to be in. Um, and But, you know, even there were other white artists contemporary to Elvis whose work I just find a lot more interesting and a lot more meaningful, like Roy Orbison, like uh, Johnny Cash, a huge, huge one. I mean, to me, Johnny Cash is on a completely different planet than Elvis Presley. Uh, and his music is just so much more meaningful to me than anything Elvis ever did. Or, or Carl Perkins. Carl Perkins is another one uh, who wrote some songs that Elvis recorded. Uh, and it was just a phenomenal musician and made great music. Uh, and I would, I would take Carl Perkins over Elvis any day. Um, as far as... Who's more famous, Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley? That's a tough one. I mean, I, I would imagine that they, if you were somehow able to measure how famous people are, Elvis and Michael Jackson would be very high on that list. They might even be numbers one and two. Uh, my impression has always been that Michael Jackson is not only famous here in the United States, but is... Uh, much more famous, in fact, maybe even more famous internationally than he ever was in the United States. And he was ubiquitous in the United States in the 80s. Uh, the impression I always got was that Michael Jackson was just so huge all around the world. And I don't know if Elvis was. I mean, I think he was certainly very well known. Elvis was certainly internationally famous and renowned, in, especially in his day. But I feel like Michael Jackson even more so. I think, I mean, Michael Jackson sold more records. Michael Jackson uh, was just, you know, this cultural phenomenon for decades. Uh, and I just, I, I, it would probably be Michael Jackson if I had to choose. It would probably, I think he would be a little more famous than Elvis. Uh, and, and, you know, not that this means anything, but on my MP3 player, I do have some Michael Jackson, and I, I don't think I have any Elvis. So... Isaac Barlow, Steve, if an alien landed on our planet, would this finally put to rest that there is no God, or would it be hailed as God or a significant religious figure showing himself to his believers? Thanks, you demand. I don't think it would be hailed as God. I think even most deeply fundamentalist religious people are, are, are <laughs> aware enough that they would recognize an alien visitor as an alien visitor. They wouldn't think that it was their God or some other God coming down from heaven to, uh, you know, to reveal himself to the world. I think most people would, would be able to figure out that it was an alien, but I don't think it would shake the conviction that God exists in most really deeply convicted religious people. I, mean, I remember I, I used to watch TBN and I always felt like a voyeur because I was like peeking in on this little, this, this world of evangelicals and fundamentalists. Um, and I remember uh, somebody talking about if there were aliens. I think it was Kenneth Copeland. Kenneth Copeland was talking about how he had 
had uh, a conversation with another Christian evangelist, I think it was R.W. Schambach, uh, about, you know, what if there were aliens? What if the aliens turn out to be real and they come down to earth? And, you know, uh, what do you make of that? What does that, what, what, what implications does that have on your religion? And R.W. Schambach is supposed to have said, well, I don't know, but if they need a savior, Jesus is the man. So, you know, I, I get the feeling <laughs> that they would adapt their beliefs to sort of include the aliens rather than taking the aliens as a sign that they had it all wrong. Kevin Faskins, Steve, I assume that because you are an atheist, you have no morals. What common misconception about atheists' atheism most disturbs, irritates, annoys you? Well, that one's a big one. Uh, the, uh, the assumption that atheists have no morals or that atheists are just hedonists, that we just do whatever we want. Uh, that's that's a big one. It also bothers me when people assume that atheists are all uh, nihilists or depressed or see no meaning in life. Uh, you know that that really bothers me because some of the most you know joyous, exciting people that I know that take such pleasure from life and and and, and look at the world with such wonder and and, and such excitement and such optimism are atheists, are people who look at the world as it is, look at the world as explained and revealed by science with no supernatural dimension, no hope of an afterlife, no miracles or anything like that, and see it as this wonderful, enticing, exciting, invigorating place. Um, so, I mean, it, it couldn't be further from the truth that atheists are just sort of these dull, dour, hopeless depressed people who just sit around, you know, and they live these meaningless lives and they, they don't see any purpose to anything. And that is the exact opposite of most of my fellow atheists that I know. And it certainly isn't how I am. It certainly isn't my personality or my attitude or my outlook or how I live my life. Asaf Elron questions, what is your theory belief on what happens to your consciousness after you die? Do you think consciousness is matter? If so, why would it disappear when your body dies? I'm not talking about the brain functions. I'm talking about the thing that experiences the whole of these neurons flying around. In other words, what is the origin of consciousness? Why would neurons make a brain feel as opposed to a rock? On a basic atomic level, they are the same. I do think that consciousness is ultimately rooted in the material. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not a neurologist. I must be careful not to fight above my weight here. I, I'm really not sure how you would describe consciousness as a thing other than to describe what it's like to be conscious. I mean, I don't know if you can describe it strictly in material terms or if it's, uh, you know, a chemical reaction or if it's uh, something to do with uh, energy or electricity. I, I don't know. I do know that it is rooted in the physical, that there is nothing supernatural about it. There's nothing transcendent about it. There's nothing permanent about it. Uh, there's nothing everlasting or mystical or spiritual. None of that stuff exists. Uh, so when we die, our consciousness ceases because our consciousness is not just... You say that uh, a rock and a brain are the same on the atomic level, and even if I grant you that that's true, uh, you're sort of assuming that the basic atomic structure tells the whole story, and I don't think it does. A brain, unlike a rock, is an organism. It performs functions. It has, uh, it, it, it undergoes chemical reactions. There are things happening in a brain. There are electrical chemical things happening in a brain. And that is what produces our thoughts, our consciousness. Not just the mere fact of the atoms present. It's what those atoms and molecules are doing. And when those processes cease, when life ceases, and all the processes are no longer operating, then your consciousness uh, fails. Your consciousness disappears, uh, and that, I mean that—that that, that is is what I think happens. That, and again, complete layman's understanding of of how the brain works. You know, if you really want an answer to the question, you should probably ask a neurologist or or someone who knows a little bit more about the brain on on a, a much more professional scientific level than I do. Um, but that's my understanding, and that's the difference between a living thing and a rock. A rock is just sort of sitting there. It's not really doing anything. A living thing, an organism, is doing things. 
Uh, life itself is a process. It's an electrochemical biological process. And when that process stops, the stuff might still be there, but it's not doing anything. And it's the fact that it was doing something that made it alive. Firefly 4F4, what is the worst storyline in WWE history? My choice would be Katie Vick, which is the primary reason I stopped watching. Rather than WWE slash F alone, you can pick from any company. Katie Vick was pretty bad. Katie Vick would have to be a contender um, no matter what era or company or whatever you're talking about. That was a really, really terrible storyline. Although for me, it's hard, it's hard for me to go for something other than the Black Scorpion. Um, the Black Scorpion was something that, I mean, when I was 10 years old, when it was actually going on, I didn't think it was so bad. But now as an adult, having gone back and, and watched a lot of the old Black Scorpion stuff on YouTube, um, the Black Scorpion storyline was so bad. It was so terrible. And, I mean, Ole Anderson booked a lot of terrible storylines in a lot of territories. Ole Anderson was just a terrible booker of angles and storylines, I think. Uh, and the Black Scorpion might be the worst thing he ever came up with. It completely killed Sting's first world title reign. It was just so stupid. And like, with the, the, guy, the guy in the mask performing magic tricks in the audience. I mean, he was doing, he was like the masked magician, but like seven or eight years too soon. Um... And then the, the, the big reveal at the end when they finally unmask the scorpion and, oh, who is this person who's been tormenting Sting? And it just turns out to be Ric Flair, the guy who he won the title from, the guy who he was feuding with over the summer. That, you know, instead of doing something new and different, bringing someone else in, like, I mean, they could have, they're all, they, I mean, just thinking back to that time and just putting yourself in that position and saying, okay, we have a mask, man, and we want to have a reveal and we want to have this new opponent for Sting. I mean, think of all the people that it could have been that would have been more interesting than just putting Ric Flair back in there. Not that I have anything against Ric Flair. He's one of the greatest of all time, but he had already worked Sting. And Sting is the champion. Sting is the man. Give him someone new, you know? What about the Great Muda? He had, had classic matches two years before with the Great Muda. Uh, bring Muda back. Put Muda up there into the, into the world title picture. I don't know why they didn't do that. I don't know if Muda even would have been available, but the point is there were other better options to go with than Flair, uh, and really, no matter who they would have put in at that point, the masked man, this, the Black Scorpion gimmick was just dead. It, it was so stupid and done and lame and just completely killed Sting's uh, heat as world champion. So that would be my pick. Although Katie Vick is definitely, definitely right up there. Here's one from Ptolemy. On the subject of musicals, have you seen Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog and did you or did you not like it? And Randy Owens uh, also asked about Dr. Horrible and, and asked if that might be an exception to my dislike of musicals. I did like Dr. Horrible, but I liked it despite the songs. I just, I didn't like the songs. And that's really the main, one of the main reasons. I have other problems with musicals too, but one of the main reasons why I don't like most musicals is that I just think the music is terrible. I just think musical songs are just awful. Just so, just, ugh. Why would, it, like, why would anybody listen to this? And I know that original soundtracks sell big, and I know that there are people who love listening to songs from musicals, and that's fine for them. I just don't get it. I have never heard a song from a musical that I felt like listening to apart from uh, the musical, with a few exceptions. The only exceptions are uh, if, if it's a funny song, you know, like, like songs from the South Park movie or songs from Book of Mormon that are funny, that can make me laugh. That, it's the rule of funny overwhelms almost everything with me. If something is funny, it could be funny in a genre that I usually hate, but if it's funny, I will almost always accept it. Uh, the rule of funny conquers all. And that's kind of what happens with Dr. Horrible, too. Dr. Horrible is, is really funny. I love Nathan Fillion in it. I think Neil Patrick Harris is great in it. Uh, I love the, I love that the, the, uh, the leader of the, the League of Supervillains in it is a horse. And it's you, and it's like a it's like a background gag. Like at the very end, you see like the League of Supervillains that Doctor Horrible has has been wanting to join, and you see at the head of the table is Bad Horse, the leader of the group, and it's an actual horse just standing there at the head of the table. And it's not punctuated, it's not underlined. It's just oh, and there's the horse. And then you know, it's I love the way it's not it's it's you, it's not 
thrown in your face. You don't get beaten over the head with it. It's just, oh, there's there's a horse. Uh, it must bad horse is an actual horse. Uh, and I, I really I really dug that. Um, and I like the story. I like the sort of you know the tragic element to it. And I like the the inversion of the 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 villain being the protagonist of the story and the, the superhero being the asshole and the bad guy. I thought that was all great. I just I just thought the music was terrible. Here's one from Sorianor. What would you say to someone who still thinks pro wrestling is real? I would ask them to hold on a minute while I go get my three card Monty table and then ask them if they would like to find the lady. <laughs> there's there's a reason why in pro wrestling slang fans are referred to as marks because back in the day when pro wrestling did not openly admit that it was a work it was essentially a con they were telling people that these guys were really fighting and really hated each other uh, when they really weren't and it's been that way for virtually the entire history of what we would recognize as professional wrestling uh, it, it has almost always been a part of professional wrestling the idea of working matches of, of of the guys cooperating with each other in the ring and one guy being picked to win the match and one guy being picked to lose the match it has been part of the the sport since the very beginning it has been the 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 rule since at least the 20 or the, th the 20s or 30s that it you know the matches were worked and uh until about 20 25 years ago it never openly admitted that this is this is a work you know that these guys aren't really fighting that we pick who wins and who loses and they're cooperating and they're not really trying to hurt each other and you know it and it was essentially a con game and the fans were the marks the fans were the ones who they had tricked into paying to come see their fake fights matt broomfield if man could control one of the following which do you think would be the most valuable over the next 500 years the Earth's plate tectonics, the weather, or the path of large asteroids. Well, I've never studied it, so this is just my own informal, possibly not very reliable impression, but it, it seems to me that there is more large-scale death and destruction caused uh, more frequently by weather events than by earthquakes or certainly by asteroid strikes, which essentially never happen. Uh, so I would say the weather. I mean, but then again, if you go to, if you go on the scale of the next 500 years, I mean, I don't know. Maybe a 500-year window is enough time that we might reasonably have to fear uh, a catastrophic asteroid strike. So I don't know. Maybe asteroids would be the way to go. You know, maybe it would be worth our peace of mind for the rest of our human history, for the rest of our future, however long it goes, to be able to control asteroid strikes because then we just would never have to worry about that extinction level event coming down um but i mean on a day-to-day -day basis I, I think it would almost have to be uh the weather because i mean there are certainly horrible earthquakes that cause billions of dollars in damage and and, and can kill people in the hundreds or thousands i mean that that has happened before uh too many times unfortunately but it, it just seems to me like those sorts of events happen more often as the result of the weather than of a devastating earthquake. So I would go with the weather. Matt Lesnar, Steve, have you ever refrained from an activity of some sort once you learned of a company's political position? For example, when I learned of Chick-fil-A's bigoted stance on gay marriage, I stopped eating there altogether. There's a Salvation Army thrift store in Hagerstown that I don't go to anymore, and I don't give money to the Salvation Army uh, because of that organization's anti-gay stance. And I, I would have given up Chick-fil-A if I ever ate there. And I'm a fast food guy. Like, I, I'll eat fast food. I like Wendy's and Burger King. Uh, I went to Chick-fil-A once many, many years ago when the first Chick-fil-A in Hagerstown opened up, and I just thought the food was shit. <laughs> so I just never ate there after that. I haven't been there since. I just so I don't. I didn't have to boycott Chick Fil A after their gay marriage thing started last year because I never. I never went to the in the first place. I I thought the food was terrible. Here's one from Claire Small. Does it hurt to roast the ones you love, Steve? Actually, if you can put that in a you had to ask segment, I'd like to hear your process of five stupid things for subjects that which you do love. In many ways, writing five stupid things about things I like is easier uh, because I. I know that they're not all like this. Some of them 
most decidedly aren't, but I, I prefer if I can if I can manage it for the five stupid things videos to be funny. Um, and sometimes it's difficult if I'm writing five stupid things about something that I really, really, really hate. Uh, it's hard to make it funny. It's hard to avoid it just coming off as a rant. And, and rants are fine too. I don't have any problem with rants and they're fun to write and they're fun to perform. Um, but it's, 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 it's easier and it's more fun to do a, a humorous video. And you know, if I like something, it, it, I, not only do I, do I know all the good parts about it, but I, I can recognize and articulate all the, the silly and stupid parts about it too while still liking it. Uh, I don't really have any sacred cows. There's nothing that I like that I just would, would refuse on principle to, to make fun of or, to, or you know, to have a little fun with. I mean, and it's been that way from the very beginning of the Five Stupid Things About series. The second episode of that series was about baseball. And I love baseball. I could talk about the virtues and the beauties of baseball all day long. I just love baseball. Um, but I did baseball for the second episode just to sort of set that tone, that I wasn't just going to be bitching about things in that series. I was going to be pointing out absurdities and silliness and, and shortcomings of things that I genuinely really love. And I, I've tried to do that as often as I, as I can. Now, there were Batman and Superman and Spider-Man and He-Man, like all of these sort of characters that I love uh, that I can recognize and even sort of celebrate the stupid things about them. You know, the most recent one was uh, Sherlock Holmes. I love Sherlock Holmes. I love Sherlock Holmes. But the fact that I love him and that I'm so familiar with him and his stories makes it so easy to write a five stupid things about him. Because there's so much to that character that you can look at and say, yeah, that's ridiculous. And it doesn't mean you don't like it. It just means you recognize its shortcomings and its imperfections. And you're willing to point those out and use those as fodder for jokes. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the ones about the ones that I love, not always, but often are the easiest and the most fun to do. You know what that means? It means that it's time for... The Lightning Round. Rapid fire questions. Glib and adequate answers. E. Burwell, does it concern you that the physics of your You Had to Ask universe has the thunder preceding the lightning? Well, actually, the thunder that signals that the lightning round is about to begin is following a lightning strike that took place right before the video started that you didn't get to see. It's just that the storm was so incredibly far away that it took the thunder that long to reach me. And when it finally reaches me, that means that the storm is on... Wasp bloke, Steve, inventor of television, why ignore John Logie Baird? Well, for a very good reason. I had no idea who he was before last week, before I, I mentioned uh, um, Philo Farnsworth, and lots of people commented to say that uh, John Baird was a much better choice. There seems to be a cultural divide. Americans seem to credit Philo T. Farnsworth, and uh, uh, Brits and folks who live in the UK seem to credit uh, John Logie Baird, which is very interesting. I wasn't aware of that before. Dangerously talented, do you like classical music? And if so, what classical music do you like in particular? Oh, I really like, uh, I like Samuel Barber. Um, I like Tchaikovsky. I like uh, Dvorak, who, who's a, oh, I mean, Mozart. You know, you can't go wrong with Mozart. Not as good as Beethoven now. I think he's generally considered the best. The David Brent impression was on the house. Jim Smith, hey Steve, I have a bunch of either or film questions. Okay, I'll take these as they come. Okay, alien or aliens? Alien. T1 or T2? T2. Godfather or Goodfellas? Uh, Godfather, but it's close. The Exorcist or The Shining? The Exorcist, and that's really not so close. Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs? Pulp Fiction. Indiana Jones trilogy or original Star Wars trilogy? That one's really, really close, but I'm going to say Star Wars. Uh, Vertigo or Rear Window, I'm going to say Vertigo, one of my favorite films. Uh, and Once Upon a Time in America or The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Calvin Zero, Steve, you think someone who picks a fight with a cat is pathetic. What if the cat in question is a tiger or a lion? Well, then they're not just pathetic, they're an idiot. Jared Plotkin, who is your celebrity crush? 
oh, they come and go from time to time, but the one that has remained with me the longest is Jennifer Connelly. Mm. Jennifer Connelly. Travis Beerwagen, Steve, do you have any thoughts on the Fox News deck? Yeah, how did Edward R. Murrow ever get along without it? Wait, I, I, I know why. He was a journalist. Sepia Siren, question, do you do the chicken dance at weddings? No, I don't do the chicken dance at weddings. And actually, uh, the sight of other people doing the chicken dance at weddings and the vicarious humiliation that I experience from that is one of the main reasons why I hate going to weddings. English, not British. Question, why do you seem to dislike the American South so much? Because they let their racists make the laws. Hey, that's it for the questions. Before I get out of here, I want to do a shout out as always. And this week, the shout out goes to Tekken U Vids. This is an awesome channel. I recently discovered lots of great science content. They have videos on this channel explaining how pieces of new technology work. There's videos on how a quantum computer works. Um, the series on Tekken U Vids that really convinced me that I wanted to give them a shout out is a series they have of short videos on critical thinking. This is such a great resource. Little two to three minute videos explaining different concepts related to critical thinking so that if you have never had critical thinking really explained to you before or even more importantly and more usefully if you ever have to explain critical thinking to someone else. These videos will introduce them to you at a very basic easy to understand level and you will know exactly what critical thinking entails. You will be able to understand the concept and explain it to others. It is such a great resource, so highly, highly recommended. Tech and Uvids, the whole channel, but particularly the Critical Thinking series. Excellent, excellent stuff. So, that is it for this week. I will be back again next week to do this all over again, provided, of course, that you ask me some questions, because for me to do this, you have to ask. So leave a comment on this video. Ask me your question. Ask me anything about anything. No topic is too sober and serious and inappropriate for this format. And no question is too silly and frivolous and pointless. I will talk about anything I have anything interesting to say about. So anything you want to hear me talk about, anything you want to know, leave a comment. Ask your question. I will be back to answer as many of them as I can next week. Until then, take care. I'll see you next time.